In a shocking turn of events, the once thriving agricultural heartland of Oregon is facing an unprecedented crisis. In just the past six months, over a quarter of Oregon's farms have shut down. Once thriving agricultural landscapes now lie barren, and generational legacies built on hard work and tradition are being wiped out overnight. What cataclysmic event could upend over a century of farming tradition so rapidly? Brace yourself as we expose the jarring realities unfolding across Oregon's fields where an unthinkable crisis is taking root. Let's go. Chapter 1. Historical Context of Farming Regulations in Oregon Oregon's agricultural scene is as vast and varied as its landscapes, from the lush Willamette Valley vineyards to the expansive wheat fields of the Columbia Plateau. Yet beneath this bucolic surface, there's a complex interplay of regulations that have shaped the farming community's destiny over decades. To understand the current upheaval facing Oregon's small farms, we first need to know more about the historical context of farming regulations in the state, a journey that reveals how past decisions are influencing pressing challenges today. Let's start by exploring the roots of agricultural regulation in Oregon. Historically, the state has been proactive in implementing policies to manage its natural resources, including a comprehensive system of water rights that dates back to the early 20th century. Oregon adopted the Prior Appropriation Doctrine, a concept that might sound legalistic, but essentially means first in time, first in right. This doctrine allocates water rights based on the order in which they were claimed. Earlier claims have priority over later ones, especially during shortages. This system was primarily established to support agriculture, which has always been a major economic driver in the region. Why does this matter? Imagine a scenario where water is scarce. Farms with older, established water rights can continue their operations, while those with newer or no rights might face restrictions or shutdowns. This framework has set the stage for many of the conflicts we see today, where small farmers struggle to secure enough water to maintain their livelihoods amidst more stringent enforcement of these rights. But water is just one piece of the regulatory puzzle. As Oregon's agricultural sector expanded, the state began to introduce more comprehensive measures to address the environmental impacts of farming. These measures included regulations on pesticide use, animal waste management, and water conservation techniques. Historically, these regulations aimed to balance the needs of agricultural productivity with environmental stewardship, a balance that has been pivotal in maintaining Oregon's natural beauty and agricultural output. But why introduce regulations on animal waste and water usage? The answer lies in the nature of farming's impact on the environment. Runoff from farms laden with pesticides and fertilizers can lead to water pollution, while improper management of animal waste contributes to both water and air pollution. To mitigate these effects, Oregon implemented regulations that required farms to adopt practices that minimize environmental impact without significantly hampering agricultural productivity. One critical aspect of these regulations has been the management of concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. Traditionally, a CAFO is defined based on the number of animals, the type of animals, and how they are housed and managed. In Oregon, as in many states, CAFO regulations have focused on reducing environmental damage from large-scale livestock operations, which are more likely to pollute water systems due to the volume of animal waste they generate. The regulations required these operations to obtain permits and implement systems to handle manure and other waste products responsibly. So, what happens when a farm is designated as a CAFO? Essentially, it triggers a set of requirements for managing the nutrients in manure, the disposal of wastewater, and the design of facilities to prevent contamination of water sources. The goal is not just to protect public health, but also to preserve the quality of Oregon's waterways, which are vital for both ecological and human use. As the state's agricultural sector continues to evolve, so too does its regulatory landscape. While these historical measures were effective for their time, the question arises, are they sufficient to address the modern challenges faced by Oregon's farmers? The answers could redefine the landscape of farming in Oregon, presenting both challenges and opportunities for those who work the land. 
Chapter 2. Recent Changes in Regulatory Policies Recently, some shocking regulatory shifts have thrust Oregon's small farms into a storm of survival. These changes have fundamentally altered the battleground for the state's small farms, making what was once a manageable regulatory environment into a potentially existential threat. But how exactly did these changes come about, and what do they mean for the farmers who feed us? The most dramatic of these changes has been the expansion of the definition of confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. Traditionally, CAFO regulations targeted large-scale industrial farms, which housed thousands of animals and created significant waste management challenges that could affect local waterways and air quality. However, the new definition casts a much wider net, bringing even the smallest of farms under its ambit. For instance, any agricultural operation that confines animals for over 45 days in a 12-month period and meets certain size thresholds now falls under this category. This includes those who might only have a handful of livestock but use any sort of man-made structure for their animals. Suddenly, a small farm with a modest barn or covered pen intended to protect their animals from the harsh Oregon weather must comply with regulations designed for much larger operations. But what does this compliance mean? For many, it means costly upgrades to waste management systems, more rigorous site inspections, and a complicated permitting process that can be both time-consuming and expensive. The financial burden placed on small farmers, many of whom operate on razor-thin profit margins, can be overwhelming. In some cases, the cost of compliance could be greater than the annual income of the farm itself. Is it fair or even practical? to subject small family farms to the same regulatory supervision as massive agribusiness conglomerates. Along with the CAFO redefinitions, there have also been stringent new measures regarding water usage. The new regulations now make it illegal for any farm to use groundwater for irrigation without a specific permit, a rule enforced with surprising rigor. The state has employed satellite technology and on-ground inspections to ensure compliance and the penalties for unauthorized water use can be severe. But here's a statement that might surprise you. While these rules aim to protect water resources, they also create paradoxical situations where small farms practicing sustainable, low-water-use agriculture are penalized simply for the scale of their operations. These farmers often use less water than their larger counterparts, but face the same, if not greater, regulatory hurdles. Why are the stewards of sustainable practices facing such high barriers? Moreover, the enforcement of water rights has become more aggressive. In the past year, several small farms received cease and desist orders for the unauthorized use of water, a critical blow during the growing season that can halt farm operations entirely. This issue is now about the survival of farms that have been part of Oregon's community fabric for generations. With these water use restrictions, are we prioritizing resource conservation, or are we unconsciously challenging the very foundation of our local food systems? The implications of these regulatory changes are severe. They not only affect the economic landscape, but also pose serious questions about food sovereignty, community resilience, and the future of agriculture in Oregon. Keeping all of these factors in mind, you have to wonder, in the rush to enforce new rules, have we forgotten the human element? The families behind the farms, their struggles, and their deep roots in this land, are they being considered in the grand scheme of regulatory reform? Chapter 3. Technologies and Tactics Used in Enforcement What's even more shocking is that, in recent times, the enforcement tactics used to monitor and ensure compliance with these stringent regulations have significantly advanced, incorporating cutting-edge technologies such as satellite imagery. This has introduced a new era of regulatory oversight where every square inch of farmland can be scrutinized from space. Satellites equipped with high-resolution cameras and other sensing equipment are now capable of detecting amounts of water usage and livestock numbers that were previously unable to be monitored at such a scale. This technological leap has dramatically changed how regulations are enforced, moving from periodic on-site inspections to continuous monitoring. Imagine a satellite orbiting Earth, capturing detailed images that can reveal whether a farm is diverting water from a stream without a permit or confining more animals than allowed. 
These capabilities are not just hypothetical, they are the current reality. But what does this mean for farmers? For one, it means that their operations are transparent to regulatory bodies like never before. There's virtually no lag time between a potential infraction and its detection, which means enforcement actions can be swift and, at times, severe. However, while the precision of satellite technology can be seen as a boon for resource management and environmental protection, it raises substantial concerns about privacy and the autonomy of farmers over their operations. Farmers are finding themselves in a situation where their every move could be watched, and every minor infraction could lead to significant consequences. This surveillance capability could also limit farmers' ability to make spontaneous decisions about their land use, as they might feel constrained by the ever-watchful eye of government satellites. The impact of these technologies extends beyond just operational transparency and privacy concerns. They also affect the operational flexibility of farms. In a profession where weather conditions can prompt immediate changes in water usage or animal management, the rigidity imposed by strict, technologically enforced regulations can be detrimental. For example, an unexpected drought might compel farmers to temporarily exceed water usage limits to save their crops. However, with satellites constantly monitoring, such deviations can lead to penalties, even if they were made in the interest of saving a season's harvest. Moreover, this technological enforcement comes with its own set of challenges for the regulatory bodies. While the technology allows for vast data collection, the interpretation and contextual understanding of the data require significant human oversight. Misinterpretations can lead to wrongful accusations or unnecessary inspections, adding more strain to the already burdened farmers. Therefore, the implications of these regulatory changes are severe. They not only affect the economic landscape, but also pose serious questions about food sovereignty, community resilience, and the future of agriculture in Oregon. Keeping all of these factors in mind, you have to wonder in the rush to enforce new rules, have we forgotten the human element? The families behind the farms, their struggles and their deep roots in this land, are they being considered in the grand scheme of regulatory reform? Chapter 4, Case Studies of Affected Small Farms. Case Studies of Affected Small Farms. In the heart of Oregon's landscapes, small farms like Oak Song Farm and Godspeed Hollow Farm have become representative of the struggles facing the state's agricultural sector. These are places where agriculture is more than a business. It's a way of life. Just take Christina Del Campo, for example. She runs the Oak Song Farm in Eugene, Oregon, where she has cultivated her land for over seven years, transforming it into a vibrant source of local produce. However, her agricultural practice was severely disrupted when she received a notification from the Oregon Water Resources Department. The letter declared that without a formal water right, she could no longer irrigate her crops, effectively putting a stop to her primary source of income. For a farm that used less than 1,000 gallons of water daily, far below the threshold of the newly imposed limits, the rule seemed not only unfair, but also illogical, and her situation highlights the disconnect between policy intentions and on-the-ground reality. On the other side of the spectrum is Sarah King's Godspeed Hollow Farm in Newburgh, Oregon, Known for its modest operation, the farm faced an unexpected hurdle. The new classification meant that even her small dairy, with just three milking cows and a 100-foot milking station, required $100,000 in infrastructure upgrades to comply with CAFO regulations. For King, this demand was not just overwhelming, but also an existential threat to her way of life. The cost of compliance was many times greater than her farm's earnings, leaving her with only two choices suffering under massive debt or closure. Why would such stringent measures target small-scale operations that appear to pose little threat to the environment? Recent developments provide some context and relief. Recognizing the undue hardships imposed on small dairy operations, the Oregon Department of Agriculture withdrew its decision that required these farms to apply for a CAFO permit, typically intended for much larger operations. But how did this reversal come about? It was influenced by the public outcry and the visible strain these requirements placed on small farmers who, unlike large agribusinesses, operate with minimal margins, 
and often without extensive capital reserves. More specifically, this change is a direct result of both lobbying efforts by affected parties and a lawsuit brought against the state by a group of small dairy farmers, including Sarah King. These farmers challenged the state's expanded definition of CAFOs, arguing that the application of such a definition to small farms was not only unreasonable, but also detrimental to their operations. They argued that the nature of their farming practices did not justify the stringent regulatory measures designed for much larger, potentially more polluting, industrial farms. The lawsuit emphasized that small-scale operations like those of Sarah King's did not pose the same environmental risks as larger CAFOs because their animals were fewer and often free-roaming, contributing less concentrated waste. How can we equate the environmental impact of a few cows to that of thousands? The farmer's legal argument highlighted a fundamental mismatch between the intent of environmental regulations and their application to small dairies, which often maintain higher standards of animal welfare and environmental stewardship. Moreover, the legal challenge brought to light the broader implications of such regulatory measures, questioning whether they actually served the public interest or simply disadvantaged smaller producers to the benefit of larger agricultural entities. Could it be that these regulations were inadvertently protecting big business at the expense of small family farms? The state's decision to retract the CAFO requirement for small farms acknowledges these concerns, suggesting a move towards more nuanced and fair regulatory practices that better align with the realities of small-scale farming. As policymakers and regulators seek to navigate these complex waters, they must carefully weigh the consequences of regulations on small farmers, ensuring that efforts to protect the environment do not inadvertently erase the small, often family-run farms that are an integral part of America's agricultural heritage. But amidst these regulatory changes, the reality on the ground is depressing. Small farms across Oregon are shutting down at an alarming rate leaving behind barren fields and shattered dreams. According to a report by the Oregon Department of Agriculture, small farm closures have increased by 20% in the past five years alone. What lies behind this troubling trend and how do environmental concerns factor into the equation? Chapter five, pros and cons of the new CAFO regulations. One reason that these new regulations were implemented in the first place is to safeguard Oregon's groundwater reserves and promote environmental sustainability. Runoff from agricultural activities, if not managed properly, can seep into the ground, carrying with it a cocktail of pollutants including pesticides, fertilizers, and animal waste. Alarmingly, data from the Environmental Protection Agency shows that agricultural runoff is a leading cause of groundwater pollution in Oregon, affecting over 40% of monitored wells in rural areas. Once contaminated, groundwater becomes unfit for consumption and poses a serious threat to ecosystems and public health. Groundwater is a finite and precious resource that plays a crucial role in sustaining life. It not only supports agriculture but also provides drinking water for millions of people and maintains the delicate balance of ecosystems. Contamination of groundwater can have far-reaching and long-lasting consequences, including the depletion of safe water supplies, damage to aquatic habitats, and adverse effects on human health. Environmental groups often champion these regulations as crucial steps towards safeguarding Oregon's natural resources, including its groundwater reserves. They argue that the long-term benefits of protecting groundwater outweigh the short-term challenges faced by small farmers. After all, clean water is a fundamental human right, and its preservation should not be compromised for the sake of agricultural convenience. Protecting groundwater is an investment in the future, ensuring that this vital resource remains available and clean for generations to come. Another reason that these regulatory changes came about is to promote fairness and equity in regulatory enforcement. Historically, larger industrial farms have shouldered the burden of compliance with CAFO regulations, while smaller operations have operated with fewer restrictions. By leveling the playing field, and subjecting all farms to the same regulatory standards, policymakers aim to create a more equitable regulatory framework that holds all farmers accountable for their environmental practices. 
This approach aims to prevent smaller farms from exploiting regulatory loopholes to avoid compliance with environmental regulations, thereby promoting greater transparency and accountability in the agricultural sector. Furthermore, supporters of the expanded CAFO definition contend that it aligns with evolving societal expectations regarding animal welfare and environmental stewardship. As consumers increasingly prioritize ethically sourced and sustainably produced food, there is growing pressure on policymakers to enact regulations that promote humane treatment of animals and minimize environmental harm. By subjecting smaller farms to CAFO regulations, authorities signal their commitment to upholding these values and ensuring that all agricultural operations adhere to high standards of animal welfare and environmental sustainability. However, Critics of the recent changes in CAFO legislation raise valid concerns about the disproportionate impact on small farms. While the intention may be to improve environmental protection, opponents argue that the expanded definition imposes undue regulatory burden on small-scale producers who lack the resources and infrastructure to comply with stringent CAFO requirements. Small farms, often family-owned and operated, play a vital role in local food systems and rural economies, providing fresh produce and supporting vibrant agricultural communities. By subjecting them to the same regulations as larger industrial operations, policymakers risk stifling innovation and driving small farmers out of business. Moreover, critics raise concerns about the potential unintended consequences of the expanded CAFO definition including negative implications for rural economies and food security. The financial burden imposed by the new regulations on small farms is staggering, with many struggling to keep their operations afloat in the face of mounting compliance costs and decreased productivity. According to a recent study by the Oregon Department of Agriculture, small farms have seen their operating costs soar by an average of 25% in the past year alone primarily due to regulatory compliance expenses. This steep increase in costs has left many small farmers grappling with the difficult decision of whether to continue farming or close their doors for good. Imagine pouring your heart and soul into your family farm, only to be met with a barrage of costly upgrades and regulatory hurdles. For many small farmers like those in Oregon, this scenario is all too real. The need to comply with stringent environmental regulations has forced them to divert precious resources away from their core operations, leaving them teetering on the brink of financial ruin. One of the primary challenges small farms face is the cost of compliance with CAFO regulations. These regulations require farms to implement costly infrastructure upgrades and adopt expensive waste management practices placing an unbearable financial strain on already struggling operations. A study by the Oregon Farm Bureau found that the average cost of upgrading infrastructure to meet CAFO requirements can exceed $100,000 per farm, a staggering sum for operations operating on thin profit margins. Moreover, the economic ramifications of small farm closures extend beyond local communities, reverberating throughout the entire state economy. Small farms are not only providers of food, they are also engines of economic activity, supporting jobs and injecting capital into rural communities. Agriculture is a cornerstone of Oregon's economy, contributing over $50 billion annually to the state's economy and supporting over 300,000 jobs. When small farms shut down, the ripple effects are felt across the entire agricultural sector, from suppliers and distributors to processors and retailers. It results in job losses, reduced economic activity, and increased food insecurity, particularly in rural areas where access to alternative employment and food sources may be limited. Furthermore, the closure of small farms undermines the resilience and diversity of local food systems, making communities more vulnerable to disruptions in the global food supply chain. Small farms often produce a wide variety of crops and livestock breeds, providing consumers with access to fresh, locally grown food and promoting agricultural biodiversity. When they disappear, consumers are left with fewer options for accessing nutritious, locally sourced food, leading to increased reliance on imported and industrially produced food products. 
This is why the closure of small farms represents a loss not just for individual farmers, but for the entire state of Oregon. It's a loss of livelihoods, of cultural heritage, and of the vibrant culture of rural life that makes Oregon unique. Chapter 6. Comparative Analysis with Other States But what can Oregon learn from the experiences of other states grappling with similar environmental and agricultural challenges? How do their policies and outcomes compare, and what lessons can be gleaned to inform Oregon's approach moving forward? Let's take a closer look at states like California and Vermont, which, like Oregon, boast diverse agricultural landscapes and face pressing environmental concerns. California, often referred to as the breadbasket of the United States, shares many environmental and agricultural challenges with Oregon, despite their geographical and climatic differences. Both states boast diverse agricultural landscapes and face pressing concerns related to water scarcity, pollution, and sustainability. However, California's experiences in tackling these challenges offer valuable lessons for Oregon as it seeks to develop effective strategies for environmental stewardship and agricultural sustainability. One of the most prominent environmental challenges facing both California and Oregon is water scarcity. Both states rely heavily on irrigation for agriculture, making water management a critical issue for the sustainability of their agricultural industries. In California, the arid climate and competing demands for water from urban, agricultural, and environmental sectors have led to conflicts over water allocation and usage. Oregon, although blessed with more abundant rainfall than California, still grapples with water scarcity in certain regions, particularly during drought periods. Lessons from California's experience in managing water resources could inform Oregon's efforts to develop sustainable water management practices that balance the needs of agriculture, urban communities, and the environment. Can Oregon learn from California's approach to water management, even with its different climatic conditions? A potential solution lies in California's Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which provides a notable example of proactive water management legislation. Enacted in 2014, SGMA aims to achieve sustainable groundwater management by requiring the formation of local groundwater sustainability agencies responsible for developing and implementing groundwater sustainability plans. These plans must ensure that groundwater extraction does not exceed recharge rates, thereby preventing long-term depletion of aquifers. By prioritizing groundwater sustainability, and empowering local stakeholders to manage water resources collaboratively, SGMA offers a model for Oregon to consider as it seeks to address its own water management challenges. Could Oregon benefit from a similar framework for groundwater management? By engaging local communities and stakeholders in decision-making processes, Oregon could develop tailored solutions that address the specific needs and priorities of different regions within the state. Furthermore, California's experience with water recycling and reuse presents opportunities for Oregon to explore innovative solutions to water scarcity. In response to dwindling water supplies, California has invested in wastewater treatment and recycling infrastructure to augment water resources for agriculture, industry, and urban use. Oregon could leverage similar strategies to maximize the efficiency of its water use and reduce reliance on finite freshwater sources. By investing in water recycling technologies and promoting decentralized water reuse systems, Oregon can enhance its water resilience and mitigate the impacts of drought and climate change on agriculture. In addition to water scarcity, both California and Oregon face challenges related to agricultural pollution and environmental degradation. Runoff from agricultural activities, including pesticide and fertilizer use, poses threats to water quality and ecosystem health in both states. California's Central Valley, a major agricultural region known for its intensive farming practices, has been particularly affected by nutrient pollution, salinity, and sedimentation in waterways. But the Californian government has also taken steps to deal with this. The Central Valley Water Quality Control Plan, for example, outlines comprehensive strategies for reducing nutrient and pesticide runoff from agricultural lands while protecting sensitive ecosystems and aquatic habitats. By implementing targeted best management practices, 
such as vegetative buffers, cover cropping, and precision irrigation, California aims to minimize the environmental impacts of agriculture while maintaining productivity and profitability. Similarly, Vermont, known for its picturesque dairy farms and artisanal food producers, faces its own set of environmental challenges, including water quality issues related to agricultural runoff and nutrient pollution. In recent years, Vermont has implemented programs like the Vermont Clean Water Initiative, which provides funding and technical assistance to farmers to support conservation practices and improve water quality. By incentivizing voluntary adoption of best management practices, Vermont aims to protect its water resources while preserving the economic viability of its agricultural sector. So, what can Oregon learn from the policies and outcomes observed in these states? One key takeaway is the importance of collaboration and stakeholder engagement in developing effective environmental regulations. Both California and Vermont have actively involved farmers, industry stakeholders, and environmental groups in the policy-making process, ensuring that regulations are practical, science-based, and tailored to the needs of local agricultural communities. By fostering a spirit of cooperation and dialogue, Oregon can develop regulatory frameworks that strike a balance between environmental protection and agricultural sustainability. Another lesson from California and Vermont is the value of targeted financial incentives and technical assistance to support farmers in adopting sustainable practices. Programs like California's Sustainable Agricultural Lands Conservation Program and Vermont's Clean Water Initiative provide farmers with the resources they need to implement conservation measures such as cover cropping, nutrient management, and erosion control. By investing in on-farm conservation, these states not only improve environmental outcomes, but also enhance the resilience and productivity of agricultural operations. Moreover, Vermont's emphasis on voluntary incentive-based approaches to water quality improvement offers insights into effective strategies for engaging farmers in conservation efforts. By providing financial incentives, technical assistance, and education, Oregon can encourage widespread adoption of best management practices and empower farmers to be stewards of the land. Furthermore, promoting market access and value-added agricultural opportunities can strengthen the economic viability of small farms and enhance their resilience to regulatory challenges. By facilitating direct marketing channels, farm-to-table initiatives, and agritourism ventures, Policymakers can help small farmers diversify their income streams, capture a greater share of the value chain, and build stronger connections with consumers. Value-added products such as specialty crops, artisanal foods, and organic goods can command premium prices in the market, providing small farmers with additional revenue opportunities and incentivizing investments in sustainable production methods. Thanks for watching another episode. Click the next video on your screen for more.